Income splitting. If you and your financial planner apply the ideas in this video, it'll save you thousands of dollars in taxes every year. And as a retiree, every dollar counts. Every dollar that you don't need to pay the CRA is a dollar that you get to spend for your family and your dream retirement. And more importantly, this is a 223,000 tax improvement compared to if there was no income tax split at all. The idea behind income splitting is very simple. If you and your spouse can divide your income as evenly as possible, you would pay less in taxes than if all of that income is declared just under one of you. Let me first quantify the impact with a one year example. This is the retirement cash flow software that I use, but right now I'll use it just to show you the tax impact and planning decision making for one year. This is for Marvin and Jenny Hope. I've stripped all of their income sources so that we can focus on just one year. Let's pretend that they need $100,000 in pre-tax income to fund their lifestyle. In this case, all that income is declared under Jen. She earns and pays taxes on $100,000. See, whether that's employment income or drawing from RRSPs, it all works as ordinary income, so it works the same way. In this case, her total tax is $18,273 leaving them with $81,727 to spend. If they were somehow able to achieve a perfect split, in that case, Jen would declare $50,000 in taxable income and Marvin will declare $50,000 also. So the family taxable income stays the same at $100,000. The tax impact here though is quite different. The total family tax is $12,448 leaving them with $87,552 to spend. That's $5,825 more. To a retiree, that could mean an extra trip to Mexico or fully funding your annual contribution to your grandchildren's education plan, if that's a goal of yours, or almost $6,000 that you could be allocating towards your estate, if that's a big part of your plan. Imagine how much that would be in 20 to 25 years. See, if you were able to unlock $5,000 a year in your retirement, what would you do with it? Can you let me know in the comments below? I hope you now understand why this matters so much. This is so important. So let me talk to you about how this can be done. Before I get there, if you're the type of person that seeks information like this and you're near retirement, I invite you to our free webinar series designed to help you make the most out of your retirement transition. Simply visit the links below or go to retirementlaunch.com and that will take you to our resource pages. When you realize just how much value is there, come back, like this video. It helps other people discover our channel and videos like this. It takes a second. So now let me explain and expand this case study a little bit further for Marvin and Jen Hope. Where they could potentially save $223,000 in taxes and add back significant dollars in their spending and their ability to live a better retirement. See, let's expand this case study. The background here is that Jen worked early in her career, but as soon as they had kids, they decided that she'll be a homemaker and just work again once the kids are in school full time. Unfortunately, because they're part of that sandwich generation, like many of you are, I'm assuming, Jen's mom actually ended up becoming ill and she needed to be there to provide care. So this left Jen with minimal CPP contributions and they never really ended up making spousal RSP contributions for her when she wasn't working. Now they're 65 and they have the following resources and income sources in retirement. By the way, the average return that we'll be using as we compare these scenarios is quite conservative at 4.16% of retirement. Marvin has $700,000 in RSPs and he'll have a pension of $25,000 a year adjusted to inflation. He's entitled to the average CPP and he gets all of the OAS available to him based on his residency. Jen, on the other hand, will only be entitled to 20% of the CPP and 100% of the OAS. They'll take all their government benefits at 70. 
Okay, I have other videos explaining why. However, in this case, we'll just leave that and keep that as a fixed assumption. I spent time laying this out here because all of these will be kept constant when I make comparisons when it comes to income splitting. We'll project their retirement age until they're 100 years old. I know that's long, but I'd rather stress test for a longer retirement. So let's start with a baseline. Given their current assets and income sources, they can sustain an after-tax spend of $74,447 every year, and that's in 2024 dollars. To outpace and keep up with inflation, they actually need to spend a total of $3,946,162 throughout their whole retirement. In this case, Jen will have an effective tax rate of zero throughout her retirement. Woohoo! That's awesome, but I'll show you why that's actually not a good thing. Marvin, on the other hand, has an effective tax rate averaged at 17.17%. He will pay $644,560 throughout his retirement. So the total combined taxes for the family is $644,560 paid to the CRA throughout their retirement. But what if there was a split? Remember, all assumptions here are going to be constant, except we will opt for maximum income split every year. Their adjusted income in this case goes up to $77,849. Again, that's after tax, after inflation, and that's in 2024 dollars. This allows them to spend $3,402 more every year in their retirement. When you look at the nominal spending, they'll need to draw out $4,126,490 to make this all happen. This is a spending improvement of $180,328 throughout retirement. Let's review how that happened. Look at this. In year one, 50% of Marvin's pension is split with Jen. So this $12,500 is being reported under her name. Her average effective tax rate goes from 0 to 5.63%. Her new lifetime income tax is $120,096. However, by doing this, we can see a significant difference in Marvin's taxable income. His taxes are reduced. His average effective tax rate goes from 17.17% to now 11.86%. His lifetime income tax goes from 664000 to $320,765. That's a reduction of $343,795. So Jen's taxes go up, Marvin's goes down significantly. Their combined tax is $440,000 as a household they save $203,669 of taxes throughout their retirement. So let me go a little bit further here. Not all income is splittable. There are different rules for what you can split as pension income before 65 and after 65. You can see the full list in the resources section below. But this is not where this ends. I'll give you one more planning example to look at because if you review the scenario here, look at Jen's taxable income from 65 to 71. The only splittable income here is the defined benefit pension. That's the only thing that qualifies based on their current assumptions. This gives us further planning opportunity. That's because by default, most investors and even as far as saying most other advisors, especially those who work in a bank, defer converting RSP to a RIF. They leave it defaulted to conversion at age 71. It's lazy planning. The issue there is RSP withdrawals, unless it's an annuity, is not eligible for pension income splitting. So if you can see here, Jen's taxes remain at 0% in the first few years. That's because the pension income from Marvin's defined benefit does not even exceed her personal 
income exemptions. So let's review a slight enhancement. What if Marvin's RSPs are converted into a RIF right before retiring? We are able to split more of their annual income. Jen's average effective tax rate goes up a little bit more to 7.45%, and then her total lifetime income increases to $152,921. But let's go back and let's look at Marvin's. His tax rate, his effective tax rate, goes down further to 10.65%. And his total lifetime income tax is further reduced to $268,528. Their combined household tax goes down to $421,449. This is an improvement compared to leaving the RIF conversion to its default at age 71. And more importantly, this is a 223,000 tax improvement compared to if there was no income tax split at all. That's $223,000 less that you would have had to pay or they would have had to pay the CRA. Now, I wouldn't convert all of the RSP into the RIF if I was managing this client account. It's just what the plan actually schedules to withdraw between 65 to 71. That's because RSPs still have more flexibility compared to a RIF. Now, the income split in retirement isn't simply because of tax rate shuffling. Declaring pension income and RIF income under Jen, she's also able to use the pension credit. If you're not near retirement yet, let's actually rewind this a little bit and let's see what we can do to improve this even further. If you're at least 10 years away from retiring, I would work hard to even out your asset holdings as a couple. For example, you can take advantage of the spousal RSP. Let's pretend Marvin makes contributions to the spousal RSPs and he gets the deduction from his taxable income. And then when they retire, it's taxable under Jen's name. If they did that long enough and they paid careful attention to their balance sheet, instead of it being $700,000 of RSPs all in Marvin's name, now let's pretend that at 65, everything is even. $350,000 each, $350,000 in Marvin's RSP, and $350,000 in Jen's spousal RSP. Everything else kept the same. They can actually sustain a combined lifetime income of $78,890 throughout their retirement. And when you review the total taxes, it's now $413,522. That is a significant savings. That's actually better than the scenario where we simply maximize the pension income split. So if you can help it, it's still better to equalize your assets as a family while you're saving and building your retirement nest egg. This gives you more flexibility in retirement. So if you want to learn more about the spousal RSP, be sure to watch this video right here. Cheers.